Hi, I'm Chris Frycroft and welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In the previous videos in this unit, we've looked at some of the basic eigenvalue definitions and examined some questions in eigenvalue sensitivity. Here, we're going to look at one of the first numerical methods for computing eigenvalues. We'll introduce the power method that can allow us to find a single eigenvalue or eigenvector of a matrix. We'll also look at the inverse iteration, which is an improvement on the power method, and we'll look at how we can incorporate shifts to improve efficiency. The power method is perhaps the simplest eigenvalue algorithm, and for an n by n complex matrix A, it computes the eigenvalue with largest modulus. And in the power method, we first choose an arbitrary complex vector x0, and we then iterate, and we compute each xk in terms of a multiplied by xk minus 1. So effectively then, we are taking that initial vector and applying our matrix A to it many times. So how does this allow us to extract that eigenvalue with largest modulus? So let's assume that A is non-defective. And in this case then, we'll have a full set of eigenvectors V1 to Vn that provide a basis for the complex n-dimensional space. And we'll also assume that lambda n is the eigenvalue with largest modulus. So because we have this basis, we know that there will exist coefficients alpha i such that x0 can be written as the sum from j equal 1 to n of alpha j vj. So if we now look at our expression for xk, we see that that will be equal to a to the k x0 and using our expansion for x0, we can see that this will be a to the k times the sum from j equal 1 to n of alpha j vj. And by linearity, we know that this is equal to the sum from j equal 1 to n of alpha j a to the k vj. And that will be equal to the sum from j equal 1 to n of alpha j lambda j to the k vj. And we can now pull a factor of lambda n to the k out the front of this expression. And we'll therefore have lambda n to the k times alpha n vn plus the sum from j equal 1 to n minus 1 of alpha j times the ratio of lambda j to lambda n to the k applied to vj. And we see that all of those ratios in the sum are going to be less than 1 in modulus because lambda n has the largest modulus. So therefore we know that xk is going to tend to lambda to the kn, alpha n, vn, as k tends to infinity. So therefore, the algorithm is going to converge linearly, and the error terms are going to be scaled by a factor of, at most, the magnitude of lambda n minus 1 divided by lambda n at each iteration. And we can see then that this algorithm is going to converge faster if lambda n is well separated from the rest of the eigenvalue spectrum. However, in practice, the exponential factor, lambda n to the k, may cause us underflow or overflow in our finite precision arithmetic system after a number of iterations. And therefore, the standard form of the power method is actually the normalized power method. And here, we again begin with an arbitrary vector x0, and we perform iterations for k equal 1, 2, and so on. And in each iteration, we compute yk as equal to a times xk minus 1. And then we compute xk by normalizing yk. So convergence analysis of the normalized power method is essentially the same as for the unnormalized method. The only difference now is that we'll get an additional factor, ck, due to the normalization at each step. So we'll have therefore that xk is equal to ck times lambda n to the k of alpha n vn 
plus the sum from j over 1 to n minus 1 of alpha j times lambda j divided by lambda n to the k times vj. So the algorithm will directly produce the eigenvector vn. And one way then to recover the eigenvalue lambda n is to note that yk is equal to a times xk minus 1, and that is approximately equal to lambda times xk minus 1. So therefore we can compare an entry of yk to xk minus 1 to approximate our eigenvalue. So there are two small issues that we might encounter. So we require that our initial vector x0 must have some non-zero component in the direction of vn. And we could also have more than one eigenvalue that has a maximum modulus. For the first issue, it's very unlikely that x0 will be orthogonal to vn. And even if it was orthogonal, then rounding error will still introduce a component in the direction of vn during the power iteration. For the second issue, we can't ignore the possibility that there could be more than one maximum eigenvalue in modulus. But in this case, the xk would actually just converge to a member of the corresponding eigenspace. An important idea in eigenvalue computations is to consider the shifted matrix a minus sigma i for some real sigma. And suppose now that lambda i and vi are an eigenpair for our matrix A. Then we can write down that A minus sigma i applied to vi will be equal to lambda i minus sigma times vi. And therefore we see that the spectrum of A minus sigma i is shifted by minus sigma and all of the eigenvectors will be the same. So in that case then, if all of the eigenvalues are real, a shift can be used with the power method to converge to the smallest eigenvalue instead of the largest one. And we'll now look at an example of this using a 2 by 2 matrix A with entries 4, 1, 1, and minus 2. And we'll show that by using shifts, we can extract both eigenvalues of this matrix. Let's now look at the program powermethod.py that implements the normalized power method and can also incorporate a shift. And we're going to test this program on the 2x2 two two matrix A with components 4, 1, 1, and minus 2. And this matrix has eigenvalues of lambda 1 equal to minus 2.16 and lambda 2 equal to 4.16. If we look at the program, then we first create our matrix A, and initially we're going to run the program with no shift. We'll then set the initial guess for our vector to be used in the power method, and we're going to just choose the components randomly. We'll also set an iteration counter. We're going to perform the power iteration, until the relative eigenvalue change falls below a tolerance. And we'll therefore set dummy values of this relative change and the eigenvalue that will be replaced by valid values later. And we'll then keep looping through this iteration until that relative change falls below 10 to the minus six. We'll store the previous values of the eigenvalue and the vector and we'll then perform the power method steps. So we'll first compute y by applying the shift to our matrix A and then multiplying the resulting matrix onto our vector x. And we'll then compute a new x by normalizing the vector y. We can estimate our eigenvalue by comparing an entry of y with the previous value of x. And that ratio will then give us our eigenvalue estimate. And we'll print out a status message showing our current eigenvalue estimate. We'll then compute the relative change in the eigenvalue estimate. And that will be used then as the criterion to decide whether we should exit the loop. Finally, we'll apply the shift back to the 
eigenvalue estimate that we found during the iteration to account for the shift in the power method steps. And then finally, we can print out the shifted eigenvalue estimate that should match one of the two values of our test matrix. So let's now go ahead and run this program. And when we run this program with zero shift, we see that after 27 iterations, we have converged to the value of 4.16, which is our lambda 2 eigenvalue. And that's exactly what we would expect here, because we know that the power method will converge to the eigenvalue of largest magnitude. And if we look at our number line here, in this case, lambda 2 has largest magnitude. So suppose now that we wanted to find lambda 1 instead. Well, we could do that using a shift. And suppose we now apply a shift of 3 in the method. In that case, lambda 1 will shift down to around minus 5, and lambda 2 will shift to around 1. In this case, then, lambda 1 will have largest magnitude, and our power iteration should find this value. So let's now incorporate this shift of 3, and we'll run our power method again. And so in this case, we find that the power method has indeed found lambda 1. And we actually find that fewer iterations were required in this case. Note also that during the iteration, it was converging to a value of minus 5.16, because that also incorporates the shift. And so in this final line, we are taking out that shift to give us the eigenvalue of the original matrix. As a final case, let's look now at trying a shift of minus 2. And that would correspond to the picture that is shown here. In this case, lambda 1 will become very close to 0 and lambda 2 will be around 6. And we saw from the power method analysis that the rate of convergence is given by how well separated in magnitude the largest dominant eigenvalue is from the rest of the spectrum. And so here we have a very large magnitude separation between lambda 2 and lambda 1. And so you would expect then that in this case we would have very rapid convergence. So let's now try running the program in this case. And indeed, we see that only seven iterations are required to get to convergence, and that is considerably faster than for the unshifted case. In the Python example, we saw we could use the power method to determine the extremal values of the spectrum of eigenvalues of A. But we still don't have a method to compute the eigenvalues in the middle of the spectrum of A. And to do this, we're going to look at an alternative method called the inverse iteration. And this relies on a connection between the spectrum for A and its inverse. And let's suppose now that lambda and v are an eigenpair for A. So we know that A times v is equal to lambda times v. Using this, we can show that A inverse times V is equal to 1 over lambda times V. So we can ask ourselves what will happen if we apply the power method to A inverse. And in this case, we will converge to the largest in modulus eigenvalue of A inverse, and that will be equal to 1 over the smallest in modulus eigenvalue of A. And typically, we write that as lambda 1. So this leads us to the inverse iteration. We again start with an arbitrary x0 vector. We then iterate for k equal 1, 2, and so on. And at each step, 
we find yk by solving the linear system, a times yk is equal to xk minus 1. And we then compute xk by normalizing yk as we did previously in the power method. Hence, inverse iteration gives us lambda 1 without requiring a shift. And this is helpful since it may be difficult to determine what shift is required to get lambda 1 in the power method. We can ask ourselves what would happen if we applied the inverse iteration to the shifted matrix A minus sigma i. And in this case, the smallest eigenvalue of A minus sigma i will be lambda i star minus sigma, where here lambda i star is the closest eigenvalue to sigma. So therefore we'll converge to a value lambda tilde, which is equal to 1 divided by lambda i star minus sigma. And we could then recover lambda i star via the algebraic relation lambda i star is equal to 1 over lambda tilde plus sigma. So therefore inverse iteration allows us to find the eigenvalue closest to sigma. And using this and choosing different values of sigma, we could in principle recover the entire spectrum of our matrix A. And we'll now look at a small Python example that demonstrates this. Let's now examine the program invitation.py that implements the inverse iteration with a shift. And we're going to test this program on the 3x3 three three matrix A with components 6, 1, 2, 1, 0, minus 4, 2, minus 4, 4. And this matrix has three eigenvalues lambda 1 equal to minus 2.866, lambda 2 equal to 5.293, and lambda 3 equal to 7.593. And in this program, the structure is very similar to the previous power method.py example that we looked at. But here, we're going to run the inverse iteration using a range of shift values to see what different eigenvalues we can recover. So we're first going to initialize our test matrix, and we're then going to loop over shifts in the range from minus 10 to 10 that covers the range of eigenvalues that we are expecting. We'll choose a fixed value for our starting vector, and we'll also initialize our iteration counter. And we're then going to perform the inverse iteration until the relative eigenvalue change falls below a tolerance. We'll set dummy values for that relative change and the eigenvalue that will be replaced by valid values later on. And we'll then perform iterations until that relative change falls below 10 to the minus 8. We'll store the previous eigenvalue and the previous vector. And we'll then implement the inverse iteration steps. And so here then, we apply the shift to our matrix A, and we then solve the linear system using this matrix and using our previous X as the source term, and that will then give us our solution Y. And we'll then compute a new value of X by normalizing Y. We can then estimate the eigenvalue by comparing an entry of y with the previous solution of x, and the ratio will then give us our eigenvalue estimate. And uh, We can also compute the relative change that we use to terminate the algorithm. And finally, we'll print out a status message for the current shift value, the computed eigenvalue, and here we have to account for the fact that the inverse iteration recovers the reciprocal of the eigenvalue of the matrix under consideration. And we also have to then incorporate the shift value as well. And we'll also output the number of iterations that were required. So let me now go ahead and run this program. And we see that over this range of shifts from minus 10 to 10, we were able to pick out all three of the different eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3 of our matrix. 
And we see the particular eigenvalue that we find for each shift is the one that is closest to the shift value. So we begin by picking out the minus 2.AA value, and then we switch over to the 5.29 value, and then finally the 7.59 value. And so we're able to then recover the entire spectrum of eigenvalues for this matrix. We can also see that the count numbers, the number of iterations required, varies by a considerable amount from values of 8 up to values of 202. And to investigate this in more detail, let's now go ahead and run this program again, but increase the number of shifts that we run the inverse iteration on. So I'm going to use 201 shifts, essentially sampling all shift values from minus 10 to 10 with 0.1 increments. And I'm going to run this program again, and I'm going to save the results to a temporary output file. Let me now look at the number of iterations required in terms of the shift. And so I'm now going to look at the output of this program using GNU plot. And I'm using a logarithmic scale for the iterations because the values vary over a large range. And we can see here that the number of iterations takes on the smallest value when we are close to one of the eigenvalues of our matrix. So we see that there are minima in the iteration count for around minus 2.9, 5.3, and 7.6. We can see that the number of iterations increases rapidly if we move away from these eigenvalues. And in particular, we get this very large spike in iterations when we use a shift value that is equidistant between two of the eigenvalues of our, of our matrix. And this is what we would expect from our analysis. We know that in this case, we will not have a clear dominant eigenvalue in our spectrum. We'll have two eigenvalues that are closer dominant and therefore will require a large number of iterations in order to resolve uh, that case and converge onto one or the other. And so that explains why we see these two large peaks in the iteration count here. But still, this is a very useful method and it also shows us that if we have a good guess for the eigenvalue, then this iteration will converge very rapidly to the actual solution. And in the next video, we're going to introduce the Rayleigh quotient, which can allow us to accurately estimate the eigenvalues of a matrix. We can use those estimates as shifts within the inverse iteration to achieve very high performance.